Hi, my name is Sarah Savage, and today I'm going to tell you about the Face to Gene Research App. The Research App is a great way to leverage FDNA's unique facial analysis technology to analyze your clinical cohorts or to create collaborative research projects with your colleagues around the world. To get started, you can go to facetogene.com, and that's where you can sign into your Face to Gene account. You can also create a new Face to Gene account if you don't have one by registering for a Face to Gene account here. Face to Gene is free to healthcare professionals, which includes clinical researchers. Once you have a Face to Gene account, you can log in here, and you'll see that your first view is of the Face to Gene Clinic case view. So here you will see any cases you've entered into Face to Gene or any cases you have access to as a member of the Face to Gene team. And this is an important view because in order to add face to gene cases to your research cohorts, you first need to add them into clinic. You can add their, your photos and diagnoses and HPO features, and that all can be used as part of the research analysis you do. So here you can see some of my pretend cases and those that have been shared with me by my colleagues. And at the top right, you can see this tab that takes you to the research app. So we'll first go there. When you enter the research app, you can see that you have a project list, and this is where you can see any of the research projects you've created or that you're working on. You can filter this list based on timing or based on status of the project, or you could search based on project name. And you can also start by creating a new project here. You can use the new project tab at the top or this orange new project button. So I'm going to start there. And when you create a new project, you can first give it a name. So let's call this one example project five. You can also enter an abstract to describe your project, and that can be any free text you'd like to enter. You can save that, and you can always edit it and add to it over time. And the most interesting part is this is where you can add your cases to your cohort. So by default, we start with one cohort. You can compare up to six cohorts, and you can give those cohorts a name. So let's imagine today we want to compare a cohort of cases that we think may represent a new syndrome, and we want to compare that to unaffected controls, and perhaps we also want to compare our cases to another syndrome that looks similar to our cases, but we think is different. So in this case, let's imagine where we think our cases look similar to Williams syndrome, and we'd like to compare these cases to Williams syndrome to confirm whether we can use facial analysis to differentiate between them. So you can see right now each of these cohorts has zero cases. And to add cases, you click on this little edit icon. So I'm going to start with our Williams syndrome cohort. And it will bring me to a list of my cases or cases that I have access to, which I'm then allowed to add to my research cohorts. So you can do this a few, few ways. You can scroll through your cases and see which ones you'd want to add. So maybe you have a few in mind that right off the top of your head you can select. And you can see now that I've checked it, it's prepared to add this case to my cohort when I'm ready. You can also search by case name. So if you remember the name of a particular case you'd like to add, you can do that. And the last thing you can do is you can search by diagnosis. So if you've marked your cases with a particular diagnosis, you can use that as a search term and it will help you pick out cases to add to your cohort. So you can see here um, a filter that will allow me to view all of my cases any cases which I have not yet selected and those which I have selected. So I'm going to click that and it will just show me these cases I've picked. Obviously these are pretend cases for this particular example. Now it's also going to tell you that you need a minimum of 10 cases in each of your cohorts to run an experiment. We don't have 10 right now so that's why it's giving me this little warning. But I'm going to go ahead and add them and I can always go back later and add the rest of the cases to my cohort. And of course, you can go back and define each of your other cohorts. And when your cohorts are ready, you can run your experiment. You can also go back and rerun the experiment if you perhaps need to add more cases or change the makeup of your cohorts. 
But we're not going to run this one today, partly because it takes several minutes. And instead, I'm going to show you the results of an example study that's already been completed. So I'm going to go back to my project list. And here you can see our new project has been added. Its status is pending. It hasn't been run yet, but we can see how many cohorts are added and that there have been no experiments run. But I'm going to instead search for the example project I mentioned. This is a project called Dr. Carey's Cases, and you can see that there are three cohorts, three experiments have been run, and there are, example, there are results to see. So we're going to click on this project and check out those results. Now first you can see a summary of the project itself. The project owner is this pretend Dr. Michael Garcia. You can see that um, three experiments have been run, and it looks like maybe some cases were added when, this, when the project was rerun. Um, we also have an abstract where we can see that the question here was to see whether Dr. Carey's cases share a distinct facial phenotype. So you can see we have one cohort of Dr. Carey's cases. He's compared it to unaffected controls, and he's compared it to a cohort made up of other syndromic cases. And you can see each of these cohorts has a different number of cases, and the experiment has been run, but it could be rerun if we wanted to make any changes. So let's scroll up and look at the most recent results and see what those look like. So in the results view, you start by seeing a results summary, which kind of covers a broad view of the different types of analyses that are run by the research app, and I'll come back to that. But first, I want to go one by one. So first, I'll show you this section called Composite Photos. This is a type of analysis that is done automatically uh, to create composite images or aggregated facial representations of each cohort. So it really just takes all the cases in that cohort, aggregates the facial images to create this aggregated composite or mask. And that can be a nice way for you to visualize whether your cohorts truly look different from each other or maybe they look similar to each other. The next thing I want to show you is to scroll down here to the binary comparisons. In this section, each cohort can be compared individually to each other cohort in the project. So this first set of graphs represents a comparison between Dr. Carey's cases and unaffected controls. Then we see a comparison between Dr. Carey's cases and other syndromic controls, and so on. And for each one, this is a comparison of all the cases of each of these two cohorts looking to see how well these cases can be differentiated. And we use uh, an analysis called receiver operating characteristic curve. And we look at this result of an AUC, the area under the curve. And this will be a number between 0 and 1. And we're looking for a number as close to 1 as possible, which would represent a good distinction between these two cohorts. We like to look at an AUC of at least 0.8 or higher. So you can see that this one's OK at 0.72 and we also show a p-value for each one. And then this next one, this next comparison at 0.911 is a little better. So if we look back at the top of our results view, we can see in that results summary that we have these binary comparisons summarized for each of those comparisons. You can see the AUC. Now going back down, I wanna show you the multi-class comparison. So in this analysis, the technology has created a model for each of your cohorts, and then it tries to predict for each case which cohort it belongs to by using that model. And then we get here a gauge of how well the prediction is compared to where each case actually belongs. So you can see that it performed pretty well accurately predicting for each case in 0.71, so 71% of the time for Dr. Carey's cases, and it performed maybe a little less well for unaffected controls and other syndromic cases. Um, but you can see down here at the bottom your mean accuracy of 61.71%. So that's a nice way to gauge how well your cohorts are able to be distinguished based on the facial model that the software can create. And the final section is to look at the clinical feature distribution. So if you've entered HPO features for all of your cases, when you run the analysis, the research software will compare the rate of appearance of any given feature, and you can actually see if there's a difference in frequency. 
So perhaps there's one particular feature that you only see in one cohort, but not in another cohort, or maybe you see certain features more often in one cohort versus another. So this could be an interesting way to compare different subtypes or um, subgroups of a particular disorder with different underlying uh, causative genes, things like that. So this is the basic uh, result that you can get from using the face to gene research app. And I do want to show you back on the face to gene website that um, you can always check out our research FAQs if you have more questions or want to dig into more details. And we also invite you to check out other publications that have been created using face to gene analysis and welcome you to reach out to us at any time with questions at research at fdna.com. Thank you.